Chief Wilson Nemalale heads a troubled village. In February 2000, a four-year-old girl disappeared from his village in Venda. In August that year, residents found a skeleton they believed to be hers. Police sent the bones away for forensic testing. When she was alive, her mother tied this string around her neck. It was the string that proved to us it was the child called Sarina Ndo. After almost two years, they now have scientific proof. The bones indeed belong to Sarina Ndo, but the tests can't tell them how she died. Her skeleton was found almost intact, only missing hands and feet. It's obvious that a jackal or some animal chewed off this part. Here are the tooth marks. It was chewed while the bones were still fresh, before they dried out. If it was dried when chewed, it would have cracked. The bones were all found together, even the ones chewed by wild animals, but no trace of the many tiny hand and foot bones were ever found. You can't see if the hand was cut, because if I dislocate a hand, it will simply separate. You won't see if it was cut. Ancient beliefs hold that hands, feet or any other human part can be used in the making of powerful medicines, much more powerful than mixtures containing animals or plants. People of Malale village believe that Sarinan though was dismembered because someone in their midst needed such strong medicine. Sacred Lake Fundutsi, the site of an important annual ritual in times gone by. Tribal elders would select a virgin who'd sacrifice herself to the ancestors. For her family, her selection would be a great honor. They'd hold her down while the chief and Inyanga cut her in prescribed ways. Her flesh, mixed with medicinal plants, would make a powerful potion. They'd sprinkle it around the village to strengthen the leaders. The virgin's screams would awaken the ancestors, call on their blessing. Her life force, selflessly offered, would protect the village from harm. Ritual sacrifice took place all over what used to be rural Venda. But times have changed. A sacred custom once performed to benefit all has now turned into killing for personal gain. Ritual sacrifice has become the brutal harvesting of body parts for paying clients. No one knows how extensive the trade in human parts is. However, the conversations we record build a picture of a trade that is lucrative and routine for the participants. Our investigation begins in Johannesburg, an Elof Street extension under Faraday Bridge. It's impossible to tell which of the mixtures and bags on offer contain pulverized human specimens. Only forensic testing can distinguish animal from human. Vendors prepare for a long day ahead. Some sprinkle their own medicinal potions around their stalls to ensure good business and guard against theft. We supply one of our team with a concealed camera. He will pose as a traditional healer from vendor. His mission, to stock up on supplies of human ingredients. The man who tells us to call him Mr. Tumba disappears for a few short moments, then brings back two bones he claims are human. Yeah. 
I like the way Mr. Tumba kindly wraps our purchases in a piece of newspaper. To make contact with Mr. Tumba's suppliers, we have to wait a couple of days. We're convinced that if we bide our time, we'll eventually be led straight to the source of the supply chain. Meanwhile, we resume our inquiries in Venda to find out where human parts come from and where the belief in their medicinal power originates. We find that mutilated live victims are often the source of the most sought-after parts. The story of self-appointed healer Ernest Mabutha made headlines in October 1998. It came to light that he'd butchered his own 22-month-old baby because he'd wanted to make money from her body parts. This man secured Mabutha's life sentence the prosecution team had never seen anything like it. They found the body of the child with the head having been uh, cut, the hands, the legs, and also the intestines were also removed. Maboda is uh, a traditional healer, and he believed within two, two weeks or so, he, he, sh he shall have uh, obtained a moti which will help to cure AIDS. Like most traditional healers, Mabutha claimed he'd received the recipe for his cure in a vision. In his dream, he saw himself holding two insects. The small one represented his baby, the bigger one her mother, his girlfriend. Whichever one flew away would be the one whose life he'd spare. <laughs> He tied her up and said, come and hold her. I felt I couldn't do it. I couldn't hold the baby down. Then he stood up and took an axe, knocked me over the head and said, hold the baby. Mabutha had forced Sarah to come with him, hoping she'd be his accomplice. When she didn't play along, he'd beat her into submission. All day, he'd made mother and child walk over mountains and valleys, searching for a place where he intended to enact his vision. Finally, they reached a spot so secluded that no one would have heard their cries for help. I tried to close my eyes, but he told me to look. I watched as he cut her throat. Blood streamed. He collected it. Night fell as Mabutha worked on his baby. Sarah was reeling. Blood streamed from the head wound where Mabutha had hit her. Methodically, Mabutha collected blood from both his victims. He collected the blood, put the calabash aside, held the baby, cut her piece by piece, hands cut off, legs cut off, genitals. I felt bitter. The baby cried until she fell silent as he cut her open. Then it dawned on me that he had really killed her. He wrapped the parts in plastic bags and stuffed them into the bag he'd brought along. Even the calabash with the blood was wrapped in plastic and put in the bag. Later, Mabutha was to mix the blood with a bottle of cola and drink it with a piece of bread on the side. This concoction, he believed, would fortify him against the police when they came. I dragged myself along. At that point, I'd already given in. I was sure I would also be killed. I wasn't afraid anymore. I wasn't scared of him. I'd already seen death. The one I was carrying at that moment was already dead. The day after the murder, Sarah was arrested with Mabutha. 
The court never doubted her innocence. She became a state witness. Her testimony put Mabutha away for life. To this day, the people of Venda regard Sarah with suspicion and fear. How did she survive? How did she walk away free after being part of such a slaughter? People believe that through the blood of the baby she held down, she now has access to dark powers. Sarah recently moved away from her home to start a new life. It's the only way she can ever hope to recover from the stigma of her baby's death. Not so lucky is 32-year-old Ronnie Maluleke. Two years ago, he got sick. His family calls it an ancestral illness. Only an Inyanga could help. His father took him to the local healer. The woman said, I will give him medicine to vomit because the illness seemingly starts here and goes up to his head. They gave me half a mug of medicine. I started vomiting and it cleansed me internally. The cleansing carried on for days. At some point, Ronnie felt so ill he went outside to vomit. In those moonlit moments, his life changed forever. They grabbed me and threw me to the ground. They pinned me down while one of them ripped my trousers off. While two of the men held Ronnie down, the third went to work with a knife at his groin. Ronnie felt them mutilating him. They were still busy when an approaching car scared them off. They left him for dead in the road. I struggled to pull my trousers up and I crawled from the spots. I was afraid they might come back. For four days, Ronnie drifted in and out of consciousness in the reeds where he lay hiding. With every breath, I bled profusely. Flies were crawling all over me. I tied my shoelaces around my trouser legs to try and keep them out. I noticed my wound had maggots. I reached to the stream and washed myself. And then I struggled to the village. I slipped, fell and stumbled. Then I came across a young boy. The young boy ran for help. Someone came and took Ronnie to hospital. Once his wounds were cleaned and he'd regained some strength, he realized that they'd sliced off a testicle. He spent 21 days in intensive care where his father finally found him. I was very hurt when I heard the news. Did they take my son's testicle to go and make profit out of it while he's still alive? They cut you alive. When you scream, it means your body parts will function. He is suffering while they strengthen their businesses with it. I'd like to ask them, why did they take it? I'd like them to explain it face to face. Maybe they were sent by witch doctors or business people. Those are the multi killers. Queen Mokebe from Mahuelareng in Potitas Rus was buried on a Saturday in January. She'd committed suicide, no one knows why. The fact of her death was hard enough for her family to deal with. Then on Monday they heard that her grave had been disturbed. Her father rushed over to the cemetery to see what was going on. And then When we buried her, we put flowers on the grave. When we went back to see the grave again, it was messy. Whoever had been digging was in a hurry. Clothes that had been on her body were strewn around. We suspect the body would have been stolen, that there'd be no body inside. It was a surprise when we got to the bottom and we saw what we saw. The lid of the coffin had been disturbed. When we lifted the coffin out of the grave, we found the whole body had been mutilated. The head, the arms and private parts, as well as her breasts, were cut off. 
A second autopsy showed that even Queen's intestines had been removed. It hasn't been easy. When I think of her second funeral, I wonder what kind of person does that to dead bodies. Queen Mokebe was buried a second time. It's unlikely her family will ever know who did this to her. It was clear during our travels through the Limpopo province that ancient beliefs are as alive today as ever. But these beliefs and the people who hold them are increasingly manipulated for financial gain. The Congress of Traditional Healers is waging war on corrupt Inyangas who exploit people's beliefs. I don't want to hide the point. They, they used to tell young healers that if you slaughter a person for fat, for what what, you'll get rich. The only sacrificial slaughter Takalani Matiba will condone these days is that of animals. Different parts are cut out and mixed with medicine. Each part has a unique ritual significance. Human parts supposedly work in a similar way. People used to believe if you slaughter a person and take his human flesh, meat, put it maybe in your car, your car will never get broken and your car will never get stolen. The whole hand is dried and sold to, say, a client, but a, maybe a businessman who wants uh, success in his business, and that hand would be buried at his door, uh, and, uh, upside down. Uh, the, 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 the belief is that the hand is calling customers into the, into the shop. Then the knuckles of the finger, the, of the elbow, are, are used, are, are dried and crushed, and the powder is then used in a salve or mixed with other herbs. The skin is sometimes taken well, from the buttocks uh, because that's a, a layer of body fat, and the body fat is dried and also used in a salve. The brain is used and the skull is used as the receptacle for that brain that would be eaten. Whichever parts are used in medicine will be determined by the client's needs and the ancestor's instructions to the healer. Purists say the parts must be freshly obtained and be imbued with the life force of the victim. Parts should be harvested while the victim is screaming. This awakens the ancestors and ensures their presence at the healing. What we found in Johannesburg is that corrupt Inyangas are taking advantage of people in need. Mr. Tumba is happy to see us until we tell him that the bones we'd paid 100 rand for are fake, they're cow bones. This we learned from an anatomy professor. To make up for selling us very expensive soup bones, Mr. Tumba agrees that now is the time to introduce us to his real supplier. Enter Pretty Vukuta, a cigar-puffing middleman. He represents suppliers from a local hospital or mortuary. Despite our many questions, he never specifies. Vukuta signs a receipt for a 400 rand deposit on a human brain, eye and kneecaps. Vukuta says he's been selling parts for 10 years and used to be supplied by his own mother, who worked at a big local hospital. Our undercover journalist goes to draw the rest of the cash. The asking price is 1,800 rand. Bukuta goes along. The specimens are left with a security guard at Faraday Market. Mr. Bukuta, can we speak to you for a moment? We're a crew from the SABC television program. It's time to get details from Bukuta. 
If the parts are human, as he claims, and he's been trading for so long, he's routinely breaking the law. How do you comment on that? Oh, I no comment, ma'am. We uh, filmed you yesterday negotiating the deal and today claiming that you've been selling these body parts for 10 years. Can we talk to you about where you get the parts from? No, I have no comments. No comments. Meanwhile, our inquiries have unearthed what may be a direct source, a mortuary at a medical school. Talk to Lefi Masebe, one of our other contacts suggested. So we do. And we spend a whole day negotiating with Masebe at his office and at his home. Again, the proceedings are captured on spy camera. Then, over two days in April, we conclude two separate deals with Masebe in the very specimen museum he's responsible for maintaining at the university. We pay 4,000 rand in total for two human hands. And then we Uh, in the future, what are going to do? So maybe after two months, three, four months. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I can't make that with the road. Okay, we're not going to do that. Yeah. We should end time. Yeah. 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 Just be with you. Okay. Bye bye. Buying and possessing a human body part is a contravention of the Human Tissues Act. Up to now, the penalties have been minor, although the offence is seen as serious. Soon, new laws will severely penalise offenders. The law aside, medical schools and mortuaries have strict rules about how bodies should be treated. Even after dissection, they should be handled with dignity and respect. Our next step is to return the specimens and confront the dealer. We plan to give the institution an opportunity to respond. As on almost every Monday morning for more than 15 years, Lefi Masebe is right behind his desk when we arrive. We carry with us the ice box containing our purchases. We'd like to talk to you about your involvement in this trade and for how long you've been involved in doing this. You don't seem to be worried at all that you have been involved in a criminal offence. Why are you not worried about this? I didn't sell them, but the fact is that this man, because I know him, you see, and he was telling me the story of his, his uh, old father or the father, something like that. So I just give him because I know him. This was just a thing. A favour at 4,000 rand? Well, he, he's given, I didn't charge him. He said, you give me the money, I didn't charge him. Because these things, they are supposed to go and we have to ban them. Is it because they have been used already and then we don't, we don't use them anymore. Are you saying that you've never been briefed about the no, laws no. pertaining to the human no, body? No, no, not, not, not. Mm. We don't have it in this department. Masebe's superiors didn't agree. They had him arrested immediately on a charge of theft and corpse violation. He's out on bail of a thousand rand. In Malale village, the community is called to a meeting. Two years ago, one of their children went missing. They want justice before they bury the remains of Sarinan, though. If they can't have a body intact, recover her missing hands and feet, they want somebody to pay. But no suspects have yet been arrested. The child was my granddaughter, and she was married. For two years, we haven't had peace. We can't even go our way to visit, because if we come back, we may find our children missing. In the body part trade, there are only victims. Clients are led to believe they can buy powerful cures for anything. 
They're so desperate for help and better luck that in the process, innocent people are killed. Communities are torn apart by suspicion and fear. Children lose their freedom. Even for the dead, there's no peace. 